The ability to pull people together, unify them, sell them on a single mission, and go do it. Nobody was better at it, in my opinion, than Paul William Bryant. Bear had a presence to him. When he walked in the room, his assistant coaches would stand up. When he walked in the room, it was just different than anybody else walking in the room, whether it be the governor, president, or anybody else. When he walked into the room, it was like walking in church and a priest walking out at the altar. To me, he was like God. I mean, he was a handsome, tough, uh, good-looking man. And uh, when he spoke, you listened. Our players at Arkansas would stand in line to get Bear Bryant's autograph. And I thought, wow, they think that much of him. I ain't never asked me for my autograph. 38 years, 323 victories, five national titles. Bear Bryant's eventful road to greatness began after World War II. After a winning season at Maryland, he spent eight years building Kentucky's football program into a national power. But he did it in the shadow of Adolph Rupp. Bryant was a man of great pride. He won a conference championship, the only one Kentucky's ever won, and took him to the Sugar Bowl. He eventually uh, would have gained parity with Adolph Rupp, I think. But why fight that fight when you don't have to? The final straw was at a team banquet at the end of the year when Rupp had been given a Cadillac. Bryant got a cigarette lighter. Rooted in discipline and diligence, his preseason sessions at Kentucky and later with Texas A&M were famous for their in-your-face strictness. It was in the dust and grit of these boot camps that Brian's reputation began to grow. The idea, of course, was to test their manhood, to put them through a Marine Corps type of boot camp. When we were at Junction, we lived in Quonset Huts. Sophomores had upper bunks. I was just about this far from the roof, and I mean, it was hot. I was trying to get to sleep somewhere around midnight, and I went to the window, and I saw suitcases dropping out of the window above me, and then the guys going down at the drain pipes. But the ones that stayed, uh, you know, football was important to me. This uh, camp would separate the shaft from the wheat, uh, the ears from the nubbins. Let's get ready, let's get ready, let's get ready. In Kentucky, I broke my hand, he said, What's wrong with you, little partner? I said, uh, Coach, I broke my hand. He said, you don't run on your hands, do you? I didn't like him when I played for him. After we won, we were buddies, and, and uh, you know, and then when we weren't doing so well, or I didn't think that I played so well, but I'd cross the street instead of meeting him head on. Bryant coached four stormy seasons at A&M before leaving for Alabama, his alma mater, in 1958. As head coach and athletic director, Bryant was in full command for the first time and his troops hit the ground running. When he first came in here, he didn't like phony chatter. He wanted his teams, in his words, cold and deadly. We've got to get breakfast on defense. We just can't stand there and wait for him catching fast. He believed that players played best when they were driven to the edge, were driven right to the brink. He said, well, Joe, you got the plan? I said, yes, sir, I think so. You think so? You think so? He said, sir, it's time you know. You're supposed to know. I don't even just think so. Stuff. The players here had never experienced a mental toughness to the point that you had a, a form of brainwashing players, believing that they could win. It was fun and exciting on those sidelines with them. I think Bryant was the greatest coach of all time, without a doubt. Because I think that Bryant had that peculiar blend of dedication and understanding, plus an affinity for players. And it made you feel good to do things right. It made you feel good to make him happy. And when players didn't make him happy, they felt that as well. No one was above the rules. When Namath broke curfew in 1963, the Bears suspended him for two games, including the Sugar Bowl. If I do let you play, he said, I'll retire after this year because it's going against what I believe in. Heavenly Father. Part of Brian's strength repeatedly lay in his clear sense of responsibility, which he passed on to the entire student body. Well, I want you to write home regularly. It would mean a lot to them. It would mean more to you uh, over the years. Have you called your mama today? I sure wish I could call mine. It was up to my mother to put food on the table. We lived in a modest house that had about 
three or four bedrooms. The girls slept together, the boys slept together, and you'd freeze to death in wintertime because there were so many cracks in the walls. Paul remembered all that. He didn't ever forget any of that because it, it stuck to him. It bothered him. But Bear was not always so virtuous. He admitted that while at Texas A&M, some of his players were paid. He was not above uh, cheating. I mean, he admitted that, you know, from getting kids into school to making sure that they had uh, enough money to get by. In 1963, a Saturday Evening Post story accused him of fixing a game against Georgia. This time, the Bear fought back. Such charges have been derogatory to my integrity and character of not only myself, but the University of Alabama. When charges were proved false, Bryant sued the magazine and won a large out-of-court settlement. But if he was innocent of fixing a game, history is still not clear on whether he consciously rigged the racial structure of his teams. The Crimson Tide played through the 60s without a single black player, a reflection of the Deep South culture. Alabama was holding out for segregation till the bitter end. I think Bryant, believing as he always did, that he worked for somebody else, that he didn't work for just himself. I think Bryant, in that context, could very well have been perceived uh, as less than a, than a believer in integration. Probably no football coach that I know of in history had more clout politically than Paul Bryant had, but he exercised it very seldom. And when he did use it, he used it for his football program. He didn't go off stirring up somebody else's butthole. I don't think there's any great social agenda that Bryant was, was following. He just wanted to win football games. As Wallace began to act out the racial pathology of the state, and Alabamians began to see themselves on national television, embarrassing themselves, attacking black people with fire hoses. That was one set of images. And then on the other side, you had this towering John Wayne-like man with these clean-cut, hard-fighting young men. It sounds corny, but it was so powerful psychologically because it said to white Alabamians, we can show the world through this football team that we know how to behave. When Alabama does integrate in 1971, and that sent a powerful signal to the state. I can remember my senior year, Coach Brown was being interviewed, and he was asked, how many black players do you have on your team? And Coach Brown replied, I don't have any black players. So the sports writer said, well, how many white players do you have on your score? Coach Brown said, I don't have any white players. He said, I only have players. On December 29, 1982, Bryant coached his last game, beating Illinois in the Liberty Bowl. One month later, the Bryant era ended. He always told his players that the game of football is exactly like life. When the ball is fumbled, you may be the closest to it to cover it and recover it for your team. And in life, you may be placed in a situation where you have the only opportunity to make a difference in someone's life. The players sensed that he did have that genuine concern for them and that he wanted them to be better people and he took the game of football and used the game of football to prepare us for the game of life. He was empathetic. He understood people. He understood men, young men. He really didn't coach X's and O's or he really didn't coach football. He coached people. If you got class, it'll work out. Act like a champion.